I took her out on a bet. <laughs> the police captain bet me that she wouldn't go out with me, and that started that relationship. <laughs> I went immediately up to her office and introduced myself and asked her out, and the rest is history. We went through our rough times. Yes, Jerry. I, I believe that God gives you the opportunity to go through hard times to make you stronger. And to appreciate the, and the good times. And to appreciate the good times more. We pray together first thing in the morning. Yes. Uh, then I go out in the shop and, and I have my quiet time before I go to work. And I have mine. It's sort of... It's individual. But it also sets we, the tone for the day that you right, spent time right. with the Lord. We can talk about anything, and we do. But I think the biggest thing is just encouraging support, encouragement and supporting one another. Don't get dormant. Don't stop. Just keep, keep plugging along. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Yes, and don't stay angry too long. I mean, we all get angry with situations, but you have to. But like the old adage, never go to bed angry. Right, and you have to work things out. You have to um, do what you have to do to make it work. Compromise. Yes, compromise is right. It's a big word. Mm -hmm. Compromise and communication. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love any romance that starts with, I took her out on a bet. <laughs> um, I noticed the first time I got to watch uh, that video, and Pat and Jerry actually sitting right there in the second row, uh, the first time I watched that, I, I found eight lessons for relationships, not just for marriage. I mean, they're, they're sharing out of their marriage. I, and I love a couple who, who, who knows each other so well that they tag team their conversation. You notice that? Like they finish each other's sentences back and forth. It's beautiful. But, but I learned eight lessons in less than two minutes in that video, eight lessons for all relationships. Here you go. There's going to be hard times. Pray together. Talk about stuff, encourage each other, support each other, don't take the relationship for granted, don't stay angry, and compromise. All that in less than two minutes. That's great. Thank you both. Uh, we're talking today in the next four weeks about a healthy life, and we all want to have a healthy, vibrant life, and so we're kicking off today talking about relationships, and I think if we can get the relational part of our lives in place, it's really going to impact everything else because it's such a critical part of who we are, because the reality is this. God has made every one of us for relationship. I hope you understand that, that God has designed you for relationship, whether you're a Christian or not yet a follower of Jesus, whether you're extroverted or very quiet and shy and introverted, you're still made for relationship. As a matter of fact, some people think that an introverted person doesn't need relationships. Not true. They just need fewer relationships with a different kind of intensity. But we're all designed by God for relationship. And this actually comes out in the second chapter of Genesis where God says this, it's a paraphrase, Houston, we have a problem. That's a, that's a very rough paraphrase. The way God puts it is this, it is not good for the man to be alone. I mean, Genesis just starts out with God creating the heavens and the earth, and he says, that's good. And he creates plant life, that's good. And he creates animal life, that's good. He creates people, that's very good. But the first time God says something isn't good is when he looks at aloneness. That human beings were not made and designed to be alone. We were designed by God at the core of our being and soul for community, for relationship, for connections. And the challenge is that this takes so many different shapes and forms. I mean, I mean we have relationships with family members where you, know, you have marriage relationships, you have colleagues at work and friends at school, you have acquaintances, you have friends, all these different relationships. And we actually live in a world that is becoming uh, more and more together but disconnected. We live in a world where people say, I have more friends, but they don't feel connected to their friends. I have more people who like me, click, 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 but do they really like me? You know, I have people who I'm with, but are they really there? Are they really with me? And somebody sent me a series of pictures. Some of you might have seen these, uh, but I thought they were fascinating. In each of these pictures I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you four different kinds of relationships. And in each case, something's been airbrushed and taken out of the picture. And that is one of the things that is, I think, impacting relationships in a massive way. See if you can figure out what it, what it is. This, these are two friends hanging out together. <laughs> it looks weird without the smartphones, doesn't it? 
It's like just, just staring at my palm. But the problem is in some of our friendships now, we're so engaged. Now, now, let me be clear. I've got a smartphone. I've got an iPad. I like technology. I grew up when my dad was a computer programmer. I love technology. But it shouldn't rule our lives. We should control it. And when it starts to break up our relationships, which if we're not careful, it can, we need to be aware. So, so, so there's, that, there's a picture with friends. The next one is a picture of a, of a boyfriend and a girlfriend. Here's a beautiful romantic picture. <laughs> you can just see the look in their eyes as they're gazing at not each other, right? Um, that's, 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 be careful in our relationships. And then, it's, isn't that fun to see siblings play? Look, look at these three kids playing together. They're having so much fun. Look at the joy as they're playing together. I mean, you can just see what fun these brothers hanging out and playing. I mean, they can just sense the energy, can't you? And then the last one is a parent child. You love to see a, a parent with their child really engaging, really connected. Uh, in all these cases, the, the devices were taken out. And when they're taken out, you look and you go, it seems kind of weird. And, and, and that's because the, none of the people are looking at each other. And so we need to look at our relationships and really be honest and evaluate and say, how are we doing and where are we at? I want to talk for a moment about the organic nature of people and relationships. I want to get kind of a biblical underpinnings for this concept. And, and one of the great places, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, the apostle Paul is talking about the church, God's people, because the church is people, not a building. And he's talking about how we're connected. And he uses this very beautiful image for how God's people are to be connected to one another. And the image is that of a physical body. He says God's people are like a physical body. Lots of different parts in your body, but it's bound together as, as a united whole. Listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12. Just as a body, a physical body, though one, has many different parts... But all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. When you're a Christian, he says there's a connectedness. That's another kind of connection and relationship within God's family. So it is with Christ. Verse 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. And then he shows the diversity within that body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. There were no groups more diverse in that time in history than these groups. He's saying, even though you're radically different, you're all bound together and made one. And we were all given one spirit to drink, the same Holy Spirit who fills us. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And the picture here is that we're stronger, we're healthier, we're happier, we're better off when we're connected. So when you become a follower of Jesus, whether you want to or not, you become part of the church. Well, I don't like to go to church. It doesn't matter. You're still part of the church. God's people connected one body. That's why we pray every week for another church. We prayed for a new church that just started Today, their first official weekly services in Monterey, and we pray for them because they are family and we love them. We are part of a big, something bigger than ourselves. We're part of a body, and we're connected life to life to one another. As I was getting ready for the sermon series, uh, I thought about just the relational piece, and I asked Ramel, my assistant, and she asked Pastor Dennis to do a little bit of research and to gather a few thoughts about how we're wired and made for relationships. What are some of the things that have come through counseling and through science and just from studies about how God's made us for relationships? And one of the things that struck me was the importance of touch. I, I got about nine or ten pages of research that came in from, from Ramel and from Dennis, and I kind of synthesized it just to share a few thoughts with you. And it struck me, how many of the studies talk about the importance of physical touch? One person said, touch is the first sense we acquire. Among all of our senses, it's the first sense that we, we respond to. Another person says that touch is essential for a baby's development physically, but also emotionally and socially. They need that appropriate touch. Studies have shown that appropriate touch and respectful touch actually changes people's behavior. And here's three different studies. I, th I think it's fascinating that people actually study this kind of stuff. But here's th three things that were learned through, through these studies of touch. If you, somebody is doing a survey in a mall, and the person doing the survey, as they ask you if you do the survey, if they reach out, if they touch you appropriately, you're much more likely to do the survey than if they don't touch you. People study this kind of thing, apparently. Uh, servers in restaurants... The wait staff, if they touch the customer appropriately on the shoulder, on the arm, they'll give bigger tips. So some of you are going, oh, I'll make a mental note of that. <laughs> uh, this, this, this one cracked me up. Somebody did a study. Bus drivers, if a customer comes onto a bus and, and if a customer touches a bus driver appropriately, they're more likely to say, oh, just get on the bus and don't pay. Who, do, who does these studies? But apparently people do, right? And then just some other learning about touch. Consistent, appropriate touch, loving touch, lowers blood pressure, 
releases oxytocin, which is this loyal bonding chemical in our bodies that makes us connect with people. It makes us feel happier, safer, and more confident. There is something powerful about human touch because we're made to connect with each other. This morning when we prayed together before this service, we have a group that prays in the lobby over here. Some of our team prays over there. And some of us pray over here under the exit sign in that hallway. All the musicians and all of the tech people, we meet there for prayer. And I was part of that group. So we shared what's going on in the service. We kind of walked through the service. And then Pastor Ben said, hey, let's kind of huddle up. Let's get a little closer and let's pray together. And people just kind of spontaneously put their arms around each other. Kind of, the guy next to me was a lot taller. So I was like, I should have gone low. But I, there's nothing you miss and you go high. And I'm way up here. But, uh, and, and there's some, but there's something about just... Do you know what I'm saying? Just connecting with other human beings. And now we live in a world where, where we need to be careful because there's appropriate healthy touch and then there's inappropriate touch. As a matter of fact, I talked with our pastors a couple weeks ago and I said, listen, as pastors from now on, if you're praying with somebody, if you're talking with somebody, if you want to have a prayer and you want to take their hand and put your hand on their shoulder, I want you just to ask the question, would it be okay if I take your hand? Would it be okay if I place my hand on your shoulder? Some of you might say, oh, is that really necessary? I think it is in our world today. I think we just, we just need to be, and even like today, some people may have a cold or be concerned about a flu, and so they may want to, people are bumping elbows and stuff instead of shaking hands, and so, but, but we're just, we want to be sensitive to that because we want, there, we want there to be a space for appropriate, loving, godly touch, but not anything that's inappropriate. But, but in this world, let's, let's not, when we're being sensitive to not crossing lines, let's also not, no longer connect with each other. Just be wise and prayerful and godly how you interact with others. Studies also have shown that separation from loved ones, if the people that you're close to, that your close relationships when you're separated, it brings feelings of distress, emotions of sadness, and actually an increase of bad habits to fill this empty space that's not being filled with the relational connections that you had before. And connection in healthy relationships leads to improved health, to well-being, longer life, longevity, lower anxiety, and less depression. There's something about good relationships that God has made us to experience, to drink it in, to enjoy it. And so none of us should say, I don't really need that, or I don't need much of that. It's, it's part of how God has made us. We need to embrace it. And in the research that, that the team gave to me, I found a couple of quotes that I thought were really interesting. I want to share a couple just, to, just for you to think about and to ponder. Uh, here's, here's the first one. This is from a professor at the University of Houston in the graduate school there. A deep sense of love and belonging is an irresistible need of all people. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function as we were meant to. We break, we fall apart, we numb, we ache, we hurt others, we get sick. Not having good connected relationships costs more than we realize. Another quote says this, Social rejection. To the brain, social pain feels a lot like physical pain. A broken heart can bring, feel like a broken leg. The more rejected the participant said he or she felt, the more act, uh, actively there was, more activity there was in the part of the brain that processes the distress of physical pain. When people had deep emotional pain, their brain responded like they were in physical pain because it's so deep and so personal. And one last quote. Over the last 50 years, while society has been growing more and more prosperous and individualistic, our social connections have been dissolving. We volunteer less. We entertain guests in our home less. We're getting married less. We're having fewer children. And we have fewer and fewer close friends with whom we'd share the intimate details of our lives. I think that's really true. In a world where we're around people, the question is, do we have relationships? And I want to share seven ideas. If I have time, I'll share one more. But seven ideas that I would say are simple ways to grow your relationships, but they're all difficult and challenging. They're simple to understand. You'll say, oh, I see what you mean right away. You'll go, oh, I get it. Yeah, if I did that, I could see how that would be helpful. The challenge is actually doing it. And so I want, if you're a note taker, there's a place in your notes to write these down. But I'm going to share some thoughts that, that you can then tackle and look at in your own life. We have a class starting on January 21st. There's a card in your bulletin, uh, a, I think a four or five week class with greater detail, kind of getting into some of these topics. But I want to give you some introductory thoughts to get you thinking about your relational world. Number one, more face-to-face -face time and less side-by-side -side time. I want to suggest that to have good relationships, it's not enough to sit with a person next to us both looking that way. Whether it's on a sideline, whether it's on a couch, where, wherever we are. If, if we're always like this and our eyes are over here, we're not connected with each other. And our world has provided 
hundreds of channels of viewing entertainment. And show after show after show after show to where, where sometimes we find ourselves just sitting side by side with friends, with family, with siblings, with spouses, but we never look at each other. We always look at a machine. And I want to say that there's times we need to say, do you know that TVs actually have an off switch? This is true. Um, <laughs> some of you, if you're not sure, talk to me afterwards. I can explain. You, you can you find it, okay? So it just looks like a little power button, circle with a line through it. You push that and it just goes dark. The sound goes off everything. It's just gone. It, this is true. And, uh, and, and so sometimes it's, we need to turn and we need to look at each other. Uh, through the years as I've, done, uh, as I've done work with couples that are going to get married, I'll ask a couple before they're going to get married, I'll say, do you spend time praying together? And, uh, and this is, you know, and in most cases, they say, well, like before meals, sometimes we'll say a prayer. I said, no, but do you spend time as a husband and wife praying together? And if they say no, I say, well, we're going to do that. And they're like, well, but we're not totally comfortable. I said, that's okay, but I won't do your wedding unless you do what I tell you right now. That's what I say, because I'm, I'm gracious and sen- I'm a gracious, sensitive pastor. This is, this is actually true. I'll say, no, we're going to do it right now. This is gonna, is, you're gonna, you're gonna, we're gonna, and every time we're together, I'm going to train you how to do this. So I say, now you're going to turn, face each other with chairs facing each other, and you go toe to toe, knee to knee, hand to hand, heart to heart, and you pray. And you talk, what are we going to pray about? And then you pray. And as we learned recently in the Praying with Eyes Wide Open series, you can actually keep your eyes open. So when you pray for your spouse, you can look at them. Ooh, creepy. No. <laughs> wonderful. It's wonderful, right? And so just, just um, did he say pray? No. Okay. But, but just there's, that, that we face each other, that we look at each other. So I want to challenge you in the coming weeks to watch yourself in your relational world. How often are you side by side looking at something else, and how often are you actually turning and engaging with each other? And sometimes when we're even together facing each other, we're rarely looking at each other because we're always looking at devices. You can control those things. And again, I'm not against technology or devices. I think they're very helpful, but we have to put the boundaries in place and decide how we're going to use those and not, not let those things control our lives. Second thing that will help your relationships, all kinds of relationships, good questions and long answers with lots of listening. Ask good questions. And don't listen to wait for your turn to say what you want to say, but actually listen to what the person has to say. And, and you're going to get long answers if you ask good questions. So I actually, a few weeks back, I asked um, our pastors and some of the leaders in our church to submit they, what they think are the best conversational questions. And I got about 45 or 50 of them. I distilled those down to 25 great questions, and these are actually on the Shoreline website. If you go to the, this week's sermon, where it has the daily, daily reading guide and all the materials for prayer and all that, there'll be a link there you can click. And I actually just downloaded this onto my phone, so I've got it as a note in my phone. So if I'm with somebody and I want to have a conversation, I just go pull up my phone and go, hey, I got a great question for you, number 13, okay? And, uh, <laughs> but but here, here's a few of the questions that, that, that our staff came up with. And just, I mean, I want you to imagine you're with a friend or a colleague at work, and you've got some time, and you ask a question like this. If you could live one day over again just the way it was, what day would that be and why would you want to experience it again? And you just listen. You don't wait and say, well, let me tell you about my day. No, you say, just listen, just listen, right? Here's question number three. What is one interesting thing about your family history? And all of us have something. It might be strange, it might be fun, it might be kind of you know, heartbreaking, but, they, but, but if you listen, you build relationships, you get to know somebody better. Here's question number five. How can I be praying for you? I love to ask that question of people. I ask that question of Christians, and I ask that question of non-Christians because most people have things they want prayed for. Who is one person that has shaped your life and how have they made your life better? And you just listen. I want to challenge you in your relational world to ask good questions. If you say, I don't have a lot of good questions, now you have 25. Just download it. I got it printed, I got it on my phone. If you can't figure it out, call the office, we'll walk you through the process. But, but just ask, and sit and talk with people. Ask questions and interact and listen. And they, then they're gonna ask you probably a deeper question and it takes you to a whole new place in your relational world. That can be friendships, that can be family members, that can be anybody. But go deeper with your questions. Number three, laugh together and make space for play. Have fun with the people in your life. When's the last time you laughed so hard it hurt? Do you, do you remember that, that feeling when you laugh so hard? You're like, stop, stop. They're like, no, they, they, they want, it's like, I, one time I sent Sherry a tape. I was, driving from, I was driving from Michigan where her parents lived over back to Chicago where I was going to school. We were not even, it was before we were engaged. And I, I just like to joke around. So I actually just started giving her commentary. I had a little, one of those little tape players. I had a little comment, giving commentary on my drive. And I sent it to her. 
and she started listening to it and she was laying down and she called me later. She said, you almost killed me. I said, what do you mean? She said, I was laying down and started laughing and then I couldn't reach the thing to turn off and you kept cracking me up and I just kept laughing and you know, she, I just couldn't control myself laughing. Now I have an advantage, I'm incredibly funny. But um, <laughs> no, no I'm, I'm actually not that funny but, but I think I am and that, that's part of the, the trick. But, but so, so, so I want to give you a suggestion. I want to give you a suggestion. I have, I have right here some of my favorite games. I got Risk. Anybody remember the game Risk? Yeah. Uh, Settlers of Catan. I love that game. Uh, right here are mine and Sherry's. These are our personal. I brought them from home. This is our backgammon board. This is our cribbage board. And Sherry, how many days a week in a normal week do we play some game together? Almost every day. And we, have to, we agree together that we only will remember who won the last game and not the one before it. But she's reminding me that she's up two games and we're on backgammon right now. She's, <laughs> she, she, she's like, I know I'm not supposed to remember, but I'm up on you by two games. So she's that good. Uh, but but we, we, we don't sit and play for like three hours but almost every evening. Say, so, hey, you want, you want to play a little bit? And we sit facing each other, and we talk, and we chat, and we, we play a game. And then she beats me. I get discouraged. I go pout for a while. I come back and play a little more later. But, you know, but, but I want to challenge you, and, 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 some, and some of you um, say, I, I love playing video games, and that's great. And, I don't think, and you can say, well, I play with people all over the world or all over the community, but, but I would say some occasionally get in the same room with pe people, and I'm, and, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying get that face-to-face -face connection because relationships are different when you can see people, pick up expressions, nuances, and so make space to, to have fun, to play. Number four, this is huge. Relentless and Jesus-like forgiveness. You want to have good relationships, you have to commit yourself to relentless and Jesus Christ-like forgiveness. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. I mean, just dwell on that for a minute. That's the call. To forgive one another, just as God forgave you in Jesus Christ. When we had no right and no claim to his grace, when we were still his enemies, he gave his life for us and he offered forgiveness to us. That's the kind, and that's our model for forgiveness. Let me make you a promise. Please hear this. If you build close relationships, every person you walk alongside of at some point or another will disappoint you or hurt you. And you will disappoint and hurt them sometime along the road. It's just the way it works. We are broken, sinful human beings. I don't have a single friend that at some point or another I haven't said or done something or behaved in a way that I regretted, I was sorry about, and I had to apologize for. And they had to forgive me for that's, that's just the reality. And look up here. For, everybody look up here for a minute. This, this is something also. When you think about your heart and your relational world, when, you're, when you have somebody who's like a, a distant acquaintance, your heart's kind of closed. It's kind of closed off from that person. You don't really, you're not opening your heart to them. But then you have somebody who's kind of like, oh, they're becoming a friend. You open up your heart a little bit. And then you build a deep friendship and you open your heart even more. If along the way God leads you to a person you get married, you open your heart even more. And the more open your heart is, the more you can be hurt. Sometimes the people who hurt us the most deeply are the ones we love the most because we've opened ourselves to them the most. But we're called by God to extend forgiveness. And you will not have long-term healthy relationships if you don't learn to forgive. Now, side note. It doesn't mean if somebody's being abusive or hateful that you have to let them keep treating you badly. But you do have to grapple with forgiving. Forgiving doesn't mean I'll let you repeat bad behavior, but it does mean I'm going to release you and I'm going to release my heart from holding this. And you become like Jesus Christ. And even when people don't deserve it, you extend grace and forgiveness. And if you want to build strong relations, some of you right now, some of you, your takeaway right now is this. You're thinking, I know somebody who I was great friends with, or had a great relationship with, and something happened, and we've drifted apart, and they wronged me. They hurt me. And in your mind, you've said, until they make it right, the relationship's over. But that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is you coming to them and saying, how can we make this right? And extending forgiveness and grace. That's, remember I mentioned it's easy to understand the concept, it's hard to do it. This is the toughest of all of them. But, th but this is the call in our relational world. Number five, pray together. In the book of Acts, all through the book of Acts, God's people and their interactions were praying. In Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were devoted to praying together. Acts 1.14, they all joined together constantly in prayer. Prayer just became part of their lifestyle. If you're a follower of Jesus, if God lives in you, 
praying with people in your relational world should be normative. And I know it's not for many, many, many Christians. I was, with a, I was at a pastor's conference in San Francisco, and I was taking a walk with a couple of younger pastors. They're pastors in their 20s, and we were standing at the, kind of the top of one of the hills, kind of looking over the city. It was kind of a beautiful, clear evening. We could see down in the city. And there's these two younger pastors. I just said, mate, let's just stand here for a couple minutes, and let's just pray for the city. Let's just pray together. And so we had a time just praying for the city and praying for people that live there. And when we were done, one of the pastors responded like this. He said, that was really cool. And it struck me. I looked at him and I said, have you never done anything like that before? He says, no. He said, I don't really pray with my friends and stuff. This is a pastor. So I just, I said, what do you mean? He said, I just don't like, I've got lots of friends that are Christians. We just don't, we don't ever pray together. He said, I would feel like I was being too religious or pushy if I said we could, let's pray. I said, man, I want to challenge you guys. And I want to say to all of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, and when you're with other Christians, make prayer part of your relationship. And you're going to think to yourself, the first time you're going to go, if I, if I like bring it up and say, hey, maybe we can pray about that together. You're going to think, oh, they're going to think I'm weird. They're not going to. And if they think you're weird, then they're weird, and it's their problem. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, but, but they're, they're not. I mean, honestly, honestly for, if another Christian is going to, you know what they're going to think? They're going to think, why didn't, I, why didn't I think of that? And then the next time there's an opportunity, it's going to become more natural. It's going to be part of your relational world. And I would even say, periodically, bring prayer into a relationship with non-believers. I do that a lot of times with people that aren't Christians that I care about. When they're sharing things, I'll just say, can I pray for you about that? I don't make them pray because that's not their thing, but I'll say, would you mind if I prayed for you? I used to say that, that when I've, and I've asked probably thousands of people through the years, could I pray with you? I had never had anybody say no until the last couple of months. I've had two people say no because I'm asking a lot more. And actually, these both, in both cases, it was when I was uh, in, doing some street ministry and it was people in a deep time of need and providing food. But when I said, could I pray for you? They'd had some kind of bad religious experience. They just said, no, I don't want that, but I'm fine with a sandwich, but not with prayer. I said, no problem, no problem. But none of them attacked me or punched me or treated me badly. They just said, no thanks. So I want to challenge you to bring prayer. It will change your relational world. And some of you right now are thinking, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> if you're laughing, that could be you. Um, <laughs> But I, I, but I want to challenge you to really grapple with this because there is something powerful. When, when we pray together, God shows up. And you want healthy relationships? Get God in the middle of it. Parents, pray with your children. Children, pray with your parents. Siblings, pray with siblings. Friend, pray, friends, pray with friends. Work colleagues, pray with work colleagues. Pray together. Number six, consistent service and mission together. I think serving and being on mission with other Christians, particularly, is a birthplace of community and deep friendship. I think that when we serve Jesus together, God binds our hearts together. And so I challenge you in your relational world to find ways to serve. If you say, well, I don't know where to start. Let me tell you what, our community outreach ministry here at Shoreline has in the course of a year, I don't even know, I can't even guess how many different things are going on all year long. But I, I can tell you this, probably hundreds of opportunities through the whole year. If you don't know where to start, just jump in and serve. If you're in a growth group, as a growth group, say, hey, let's jump in and do a community outreach event together as a growth group, and you'll find yourself growing stronger in faith as you serve together. I, I think about a, a person short, at Shoreline here who's, who just started doing something on Saturday nights. He'd go out occasionally, and he'd just make sandwiches, and he'd take them to people on the streets. And he came to me, he said, hey, pastor, I do this thing where I, he said, I keep it real quiet, and, and he says, but I just, take, I just go take sandwiches to people and talk to them about Jesus. Would you ever want to come with me? I said, I'd love to. We did that a few times together. And can I tell you, in about two and a half hours of driving around Monterey, praying with people, giving sandwiches, and talking about Jesus, our friendship, which was kind of here, just dove deeper as we served Jesus together. And he initiated it. He said, I'm, I'm doing this thing, and, and he's very quiet about it. And he, I would never say who it is, because he'd be embarrassed if I told anybody. But, he, but he, that, he said, would you ever want to do that with me? And that deepened our relationship. Serve people together. Number seven. This is kind of a challenging final one, but accountability for growth. Have accountability for growth in your relational world. Have people that you are so close to that you say, here's an area I want to grow, here's an area where I'm struggling, here's an area I want to be stronger. Will you pray for me? Will you encourage me? Will you ask, ask me how I'm doing? Keep me accountable. In Hebrews chapter three, beginning of verse 12, we read these words. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But here's the contrast. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today. How long is the day called today? All day long. The point here is to encourage each other, and this encouragement is to, is to challenge each other, to spur each other on. In chapter 10 of Hebrews, verse 24, the writer puts it this way. 
Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Spur each other on. I want to challenge you to have at least one, two, three people in your life who are so close that they ask you, hey, how's that going, that thing we talked about? Remember you said this year you're going to be working on that? How you doing? You're like, uh, uh, you're like, like uh, boy, you, that, but that's going to make me feel pressure. Absolutely, but we need that. I, I have three close friends who I actually share my challenges, my needs, my joys with, and they pray for me as I'm working on new goals in my life. One's a pastor here in, in Northern California, uh, one's a pastor in Texas, and one's a pastor in Michigan. And I have a fourth person who does that, and that's my wife. And she knows all my dreams and all my aspirations and all my challenges and all my failings. And Sherry will regularly say, just gently, hey, how's that going? And I'm really, I'm really responsive and gentle, and I just I receive it so well. Um, I, I've, been a Christian for, I've been a Christian for decades, and I think my, so my response generally when Sherry challenges me in an area that she, and usually she asks me because she can see I'm not doing very good in that area that I said I wanted to do good. And my normal response is to get really defensive and bristly. Am I the only one? I'm, I'm, I'm up here all alone. Is that what I'm here? No. But... But, but when, and I actually, and I, I'm being honest as a pastor, when Sherry will bring that challenge, I can get a little bit bristly and defensive. But when I stop and pray, but I think I'll go back to her and I'll say, Sherry, thank you. And I, I need that from people in my life. That's deep relational connection when we're sharing accountability. This is where I want to grow. This is what I want to start doing. This is what I want to stop doing. And boy, those are deep relationships. And then one last thought as we close. I want to read Ephesians 4.29. It's kind of a bonus, a bonus one. Ephesians 4.29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Look for reasons to speak words of blessing. Look for reasons to encourage. Point out the good and say it. Parents with your children, children with your parents, siblings, friends, uh, couples, who, you know, and, and share words of blessing. And don't worry, oh gosh, if I say too many positive things, they're going to become prideful. This world will beat all of us down enough that we all need some words of encouragement and blessing. When I went to seminary uh, over three decades ago, I met a guy named Ken Corver. I'm going to be actually sharing, I'm going to be speaking at his church this Tuesday down in LA. And Ken Corver is my age, but he is one of my most consistent encouragers in my whole life. Anytime I've been with Ken Corver, at some point in the conversation, he will look at me and he will say, Kevin Harney, do you know how much God loves you? Do you know how proud he is? And he just starts, to, and, he, and, I, and I just like, I sort of melt. I'm like, stop, you know? <laughs> like, you know? And I, I don't, and, and it's hard to receive that, but it also, I love it. And I, and I need, even though I'm a grown up person, I need those words of blessing and so do you. Let's give those to each other. At the very beginning, God said, Houston, we have a problem. It's not good for people to be alone. He's made us for community. So embrace that and work at your relational world and build towards healthy relationships and watch what God can do. Oh, Lord God, we pray together, longing and desiring that our relational world, our relational connections would go deeper and be richer. Let us take some of the simple ideas that we heard about today and just begin to engraft them into the flow of our normal life. Lord, thank you for your word that speaks and guides. Thank you for your spirit that lives in us. And we pray, Lord, that we would learn to build strong, healthy relationships. That we would be people who bless and who encourage and who cheer others on. That we would learn to laugh well together and to pray with people. All these things that we could just, in the coming weeks, take simple steps forward. And Lord, blossom our relational world. And Lord, now as we sing this closing song, I pray that we would just begin thinking through our relationships. And maybe that your Holy Spirit would speak to each of our hearts about one relationship and one step we can take in the coming 24 hours to begin to live in a new way, begin to transform our relational world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.